welcome to Twill, the week in health law, the Senate Parliamentarian's podcast of record for the discussion of health law and policy. We're recording this episode on September the 12th, 2017. I'm Nicholas Terry, law professor at Indiana University McKinney School of Law in Indianapolis. And my co-host, last seen up to his waist in water reporting from the middle of a Category 4 storm, is... Frank Pasquale, a law professor at the University of Maryland School of Law in Baltimore, Maryland. Before we start, a big shout out to some recent patrons um, who've joined Twill. And I'm going to refer to you folks uh, with minimum identification, um, but I think you should know who you are. So big thanks to Max, to Tim, AGD, and AMP. Most sincere thanks for your support. It means a lot to us, um, as much the, the signaling uh, as as the uh, the uh, the pledges. And dear listener, you can join their very helpful ranks by going to twill.com, click on our patron page link, and help us defray some of the costs associated with this pod fest, primarily the cost of Frank's outfits that he needs for these shows. <laughs> this week on Twill, uh, we are delighted to greet uh, Adam Gaffney. Um, wow, where do you start? Uh, he's a physician, a writer, a public health researcher, and a healthcare advocate. Um, he's an instructor in medicine at Harvard Medical School. He practiced pulmonary and critical care medicine at the Cambridge Healthcare Alliance. And of great note, uh, given uh, where we are in the country and where the pod is today, um, he's active in the single payer advocacy organization, Physicians for a National Health Program. Longtime follower and fan on Twitter, Adam. So uh, great greetings. Thank you so much for having me. All right. So I do have a few things to do, Frank. But I, uh, first, just a quick question. Did, did you sleep in this morning? <laughs> no, I had to get up at five. What were you doing ready? up at five? <laughs> to get ready for the Senate bank. Banking committee of all things. So yes, banking, housing, and urban affairs. So just testifying on fintech before um, Chairman Crapo and Ranking Member Brown. And there is uh, Senator Warren there, um, Tillis, uh, Cortez Masto. It was a very interesting group. That's wonderful. It's uh, it's always great to hear uh, of good people with great ideas doing things like that. Did uh, any of them mention Twill? <laughs> You know, we did, we did talk about podcasts of all things. I mentioned, unfortunately, I didn't manage to get in a, a, a endorsement of Twill or a recommendation, but just came up. I mentioned the fintech podcasts I listen to, which are Wharton Fintech and uh, Fintech Insider. And uh, then uh, uh, Senator Warner joked that he listens to a lot of podcasts, but uh, Fintech Insider didn't happen to be one of them. So <laughs> it was, uh, we also brought up, <laughs> we brought up Black Mirror as well. That's, so. that's clearly an opportunity missed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Nick. We you are, you are never going to do one of those hearings again unless you <laughs> promise to wear your Twill t-shirt. I'm, I'm, I'm angling for help. We'll see if I can get to help next time. I try to All talk right. to some of the staffers. <laughs> that sounds good. All right. Um, a little lightning. Um, well, actually, this is more follow-up. Re- reflecting back on the shows we did with Lydia Nicholas, uh, more recently with Julia Powell's Frank. Um, I remember we chatted on Twitter about this masterful job by um, John Lancaster, critically deconstructing sort of the Facebook business model and ethics in a, in a long piece of a London review of books um, that we'll put into uh, the show notes. Facebook is in essence an advertising company which is indifferent to the content on its site, except insofar as it helps to target and sell advertisements. Um, he goes on, a version of Gresham's law is at work in which fake news, which gets more clicks and is free to produce, drives our real news, and so on and so forth. Uh, a great piece, and I, I think you, you connected to it as well. Yeah, I think that Lancaster is just such a fantastic writer about complex financial and tech companies. His uh, book, IOU, I highly recommend as an account of the financial crisis. And I really hope that he's going to be taking this uh, insights to the tech industry because because we all need to understand how these companies, say, develop health profiles, develop health uh, pr- big data proxies, as uh, you've written about, Nick. Um, they're very, very important issues. All right. The uh, the other series of pieces that caught my eye uh, the last week or so, the current issue of health affairs is all on market concentration. Um, and the whole thing is a pretty interesting read. The two articles that sort of really spoke to me the first one by Corey Capps and colleagues on physician practice consolidation and a really sort of interesting analysis taking us through 
through physician practice um, acquisitions and noting how most of them are relatively small transactions and um, were below the sort of dollar thresholds that would have required the parties to report transactions to the antitrust authorities and so on, and so get any scrutiny. And then a similar kind of message from Brent Fulton at um, School of Public Health at uh, Berkeley in a piece called Healthcare Market Concentration, looked at 20 to 2010 to 2016 acquisitions um, applying the you know the HHI formula from the um, from the from the horizontal uh, guidelines and so on, and really paints a picture of an awful lot of market concentration that apparently should trigger scrutiny but hasn't. And I know that that some I don't believe that either of the members of the cost today, uh, Frank and Adam. Some believe that uh, uh, the future of um, single payer is actually to have just a single provider or a single insurance company, and we could call that single payer, couldn't we? Um, uh, but I, I, I don't think this kind of uh, uh, concentration is really uh, doing much to help our um, uh, bend our cost curve at the moment. No, and I think one of the ironies there is that um, integration and consolidation sort of as part of uh, accountable care organizations and that sort of thing was supposed to be a major factor in driving costs down. And I think we're seeing it's very much a double-edged sword um, in terms of its uh, impact um, economically. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, it's one of those situations where, you know, when you teach health law, you're constantly, if you're giving the big picture, teaching about these tensions between, say, the need for a more efficient, say, integrated delivery system and then all of the laws that require sort of arm's length transactions to avoid conflicts of interest. You know, conflicts between a antitrust law and the uh, accountable care organization uh, model that, that can sometimes arise. So, yeah, there's a lot of complexity there. Um, although I, I do think it's hilarious how almost every time there's one of these big mergers of insurers, at least, um, left Twitter sort of laughs and says, well, at least, you know, at some point, it's also with Amazon. You know, I hear this about Amazon, too. If it takes over everything, well, then um, it's just uh, one. We're just a lot closer to having a state takeover of of uh, the already uh, privately consolidated industries. It's funny. <laughs> Frank, you and I know each other pretty well over the years, but I, I don't think we've ever really discussed dreams. <laughs> No, but uh, or nightmares. But uh, here's one that I had the other day. It, it seemed to follow like this. Point one: the Trump deal with the Democrats over the disaster funding and extending uh, credit through through December is actually a trick. And the idea was to clear legislative room for the GOP. Episode two of the dream: the current help hearings fail because the GOP ratchets up demands to the Democrats for waivers of EHBs. Uh, this allows the narrative of, see, we we did go to the table, we did discuss, we did offer bipartisanship, but the Democrats wouldn't move from their positions, which three opens the door for Graham Cassidy to pop into our world before the uh, parliamentarians cut off date on 9.30. So this little dream sequence ended with a zombie walking towards me, only slightly mitigated by by comments from um, Senators Hatch and Paul, who said, don't worry, it's not going to happen. I think that is quite a uh, scary dream. And I think that um, I, I could, what, what would be the probability we'd put on something like that? 5%, 10%? I don't know. I mean, the, the, the other big variable right now, I guess, is the Menendez trial. And it's fascinating, again, to think about the vagaries of health of John McCain and the vagaries of legal, uh, of sort of the, the status of, of Senator Menendez having such epical importance to the future of the healthcare system. Because if you look at, say, Andy Slavitt's tweets um, after the hearing today, this is September 12th, uh, the help hearing, um, they seem pretty positive. They seem pretty much you know upbeat about the possibility for bipartisan conciliation here. But I think you're right to say that you've always got to watch the... Uh, <laughs> Watch, watch what's going on in the background. Well, let's bring uh, Adam uh, more formally into the uh, discussion. And uh, you've got a great book, uh, 
to heal humankind, the right to health in history. And um, my uh, wonderful and valued colleague, uh, Fran Quigley, reviewed it uh, for the Health and Human Rights Journal. Um, and he, he said, and as Fran writes so well, Gaffney deftly and charitably describes uh, developments but, uh, towards uh, health and human rights, but also rightly points out that neither documents nor court orders provide a guarantee of care and treatment for those in need. History has taught us that laws are meaningless without the political will to back them up. Um, is that at least part of your message in the book, Adam? It certainly is. I mean, the book is um, very broad in its scope and in its temporal and geographic scope. It starts actually from antiquity. Not that I say that there was a right to health care then, but it starts there in order to begin to explore um, early instances uh, in which people spoke about or advocated for expanding health care access um, uh, to all or to marginalized groups. And it extends forward um, to the present day, and it's not an especially long book, so it it, it, it has a lot um, and it covers a lot. Uh, but yes, one of the one of the, the key take homes and one of the key messages is that securing a right to health um, is only partially about speaking about the right to health. Um, the rhetoric of rights is very new when it comes to health care. Um, certainly, you know, was not prominent um, uh, before World War II, but even since World War II, it only really became a issue of much discussion in the last couple of decades. That being said, people have been articulating implicitly ideas about healthcare rights. They have fought for healthcare systems that actually make healthcare right, even if um, not centered around a human rights paradigm. Um, so yes, I really do focus on the politics um, underlying um, the creation of healthcare systems, universal healthcare systems, um, more than I focus on um, what you'd think of as a typical history of the right to healthcare. Uh, focusing on on the the court um, orders and the and the constitutions, I do cover that, uh, but the focus is more on the politics. You know, so I discuss at length the NHS and where that came from and where the ideas for the NHS came from. I, again, that was not a um, political movement that was centered around rights, but in fact, the NHS did create a right to health in Britain, one in which care was provided both universally but um, without financial barriers, which is a topic I discuss a, a bit. So. So there's a lot in it, and it does deal with um, tension around the right to health um, in practice um, and the right to health as a sort of rhetorical um, argument. Yes, I found the um, the point you make that sort of rights rhetoric was not really used in the UK as the beverage plan unfolded. Um, interestingly, Beveridge was an economist, but he was also a lawyer, and he did use rhetoric um, in the report that led to the NHS, but it wasn't rights rhetoric. It was sort of recalling, if you like, um, the war. Um, it was about fighting evils, um, uh, though not political ones so much as want and disease. Um, uh, we really don't in Europe. The, the rights rhetoric tends to appear further east and frequently comes out of the post-Second World War constitutional reforms that Western countries um, uh, brought about um, um, as they amended their constitutions and so on. And then a little further east from that, it wasn't so much a rights rhetoric, but rather a political solidarity model that gave rise to um, healthcare reforms. Right. And then you can even go further back than that and speak, uh, we can go into the pre-World War II era and speak about the sort of semi-universal healthcare systems that were created, you know, uh, with Bismarck in Germany to a lesser extent with the National Health Insurance uh, Act in Britain. And then the failed effort at compulsory health insurance legislation um, in the United States during the Progressive Era. The arguments in favor of those reforms, and they weren't really, I, I don't think we would call them universal healthcare systems, even though they be, you know, in the case of Germany, grew into a system that, that has a universal coverage. The arguments for those systems was, was certainly not about rights. I mean, in Germany, the typically discussed sort of impetus, which some, not all historians agree on, uh, behind Bismarck's decision to sort of embrace social welfare was his fear of socialism, that there had to be a carrot and a stick approach and that, you know, sort of taking the wind out of the sails of left movements by giving them something back. Some people have sort of pushed back against 
against that. But it does speak to the fact that universal healthcare systems have developed in a number of different places. And even though now we think very much, I mean, the, the language around the right to health is very prominent now, even in the US healthcare reform debate right now. I mean, for instance, Bernie Sanders is constantly tweeting about how health is a right and not a privilege. And many of the co sponsors you know, I think Kamala Harris, a senator from California, when she tweeted out that she was supporting the bill, she also said, and I'm paraphrasing, that she was doing this because health care is a right. That's relatively new, you know, that that using that kind of rhetoric to defend universal health care systems. And I agree that, you know, Beveridge wasn't speaking about rights. There's a couple of places in his report where he uses the phrase as of right, like that should be something can be provided as of right, but it, it, not really um, the, the way that we use that language. That being said, at that time, there was a growing use of social, socioeconomic rights talk, especially, I mean, that was sort of... Uh, to some extent, I mean, Franklin Roosevelt gets some credit for sort of elevating rights talk. Even the, you know, freedom from want uh, idea is sort of an implicit socioeconomic right concept. Uh, but certainly in his, you know, economic bill of rights, his second bill of rights uh, address via, via radio, he he elevated that discourse. But it didn't um, really take off in the subsequent years. I mean, sa- a point that um, Samuel Moyne makes in his book about human rights, The Last Utopia, is how even though health uh, rights talk was so prominent or somewhat prominent in the sort of uh, um, World War post, early post-World War II era, it really, to some extent, fell off people's radars um, for some decades and sort of had its resurgence in the 1970s. I'm so glad you mentioned Moyne because I was going to bring up his work and also just wanted to joke that, you know, I'm old enough to remember when the Harvard Law School critique of rights was a right-wing thing with Marianne Glendon's book, Rights Talk. Uh, so <laughs> I, I think it is really interesting to think about, you know, how ideology and concepts of rights sort of intersect. And I definitely want to get back to the American political context in the second half of the show, but just to stay with the book a little bit longer and the international perspective, I'm wondering if you might be able to describe how and where the status of a right to health has been used to advance or protect systems of universal health care. You've talked a bit about the limits, but I think that the this international thing is so interesting to me, particularly as, you know, as I follow folks from Scandinavia on Twitter and see a lot of them worried that their systems are being eroded. And so I'm wondering about that that right to health and how that, uh, from an international perspective, if you've got a, some some other examples outside of Britain. Absolutely. So, I mean, I think there are instances in which the right to health has been used to, in fact, advance the right to health. Um, you know, the most famous example is um, in South Africa. You know, after the end of apartheid, South Africa obviously, you know, implemented this very progressive new constitution. It included a, um, a fairly broad uh, right to health care. Um, and you know, it was unclear. I, I think it was unclear exactly how that that would be utilized um, initially. Um, and um, you know, there was actually uh, the, I think the first time it was invoked was a case in which it involved dialysis. Uh, whether whether that would be something that the public system had to provide, and actually the court found against the plaintiff. But um, then there was the famous treatment action campaign um, case, which very much hinged on a right to health care uh, um, uh, basis and. And in which um, you know the the plaintiffs won, and uh, that very much led to an expansion of access to HIV medication. Um, the case was about nevirapine for pregnant women, um, so they wouldn't you know per- tr- transmit it perinatally. But um, it led to an overall expansion of access to HIV medications in South Africa. Um, and I should say it wasn't just the legal case. I think that the right to health um, discourse was embraced uh, by civil society movements, by progressive activists and really internationally uh, it has it has been it, 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 that language and rhetoric has been used um, in the in the streets as well as the courts so South Africa is an example where I think the right to health care um, the right to health um, has been used in law to expand um, uh, the right to health care um, you know I think there are other countries where it's a much more complex um, sort of situation and you know I in, in my book and I'm, I'm you know relying on a variety of scholars to discuss these cases I talk about um, Latin America a bit. Um, and there's a very good book that came out, what, 2014, um, edited by um, professors uh, Gross um, and uh, Colleen Flood um, called um, The Right to Health um, at the Public-Private Divide. And actually has case studies on each, on, on a wide variety of countries. Um, but, you know, in Colombia and Brazil in particular, there's been sort of this explosion of um, uh, le- uh, litigation, uh, right to health litigation, especially in 
Colombia. Um, and there's been some pushback from actually a left perspective. Well, I don't know if I call it a left perspective, but there's been some pushback against the use of litigation on the national level, especially in sort of middle income countries or lower um, low income countries um, that, um, you know, litig- allowing for people to litigate to gain access to certain healthcare goods um, could actually have sort of paradoxically a potentially regressive effect um, if it allows people with more means and more access to lawyers and more ability to launch lawsuits uh, to be the ones to gain access and that those who don't have that sort of um, those sorts of means um, do not gain access uh, and also that it could sort of uh, supersede sort of wise rationing decisions made by um, you know public health organizations organizations. Um, so I think, so, you know, I think South Africa is an example of where it was used. I think the way it's playing out in places like um, Brazil and Colombia, it's sort of a mixed bag. Um, and um, I think in other countries, it has not played a major role. You know, I don't think it's played a major role, uh, for instance, in uh, Britain. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot happening there in terms of health, but there's, you know, litigation and that sort of thing isn't, uh, on the basis of a right to health care, is not, is not really a thing, um, although people can bring suits through other mechanisms. Um, so it's an interesting time. Um, you know, in many ways, one of the other things that I talk about in the book a little bit is that uh, it, it is interesting how the right to health um, argument um, and the discourse around it, you know, which really sort of began to accelerate in the 1990s, was in many ways sort of happened at the same time that um, privatization and sort of the neoliberal push to um, limit um, the public provision of healthcare was also accelerating, uh, and sort of an, an, an irony. But um, it's a, it's very complicated, and there's a lot of good writing and a lot of good work being done on it. Yes, I think that is right. And I, I when you mentioned the sort of tension between um, certain rights assertion, of course, there's this Canadian case, the Truly decision. I I don't ever know if I'm pronouncing it rightly. I have to confess. But this was a really interesting decision that you know I thought would lead to more changes in the Canadian healthcare system than it did. But it does seem as though uh, you know we had our guest. Uh, Last week, Louis Grossman is doing this uh, history of the U.S. of health, what he calls health libertarianism, um, claims to of rights of access to drugs or other, other claims like that. So, I think just uh, it's it's been very interesting to hear this uh, double edged nature of of the nature of the right. Right. I mean, I think the Canadian case is the most interesting, the case that you mentioned, because there the right to life is actually being used as a sort of cudgel against the public provision of healthcare. Um, that case in Quebec essentially. Um, um, right, it prevented um, the Quebec, the province, from outlawing um, um, private insurance. So that that was what it was about. And there's another, and I think that the wars, as you said, you, you expected a, a bigger impact. And that was, you know, I think a lot of people were afraid that this could be the sort of death knell of the Canadian public health care system. Um, and I don't think that played out uh, in part because it was limited to Quebec, from from, from what I understand. Um, however, there is another case going on now as well, which also is, um, you know, based on the Canadian Charter of Rights in British Columbia uh, with a surgeon named um, Brian Day, who's essentially suing um, uh, to be able to overturn restrictions on the private practice of medicine and on private insurance. And uh, and so that, um, it, it'd be interesting to see where that goes. But the double-edged nature is real. Um, and But I actually think, you know, it's interesting because in a way that could be seen as sort of a recent development, but it actually is quite old, right? The rights um, from the so, from the perspective of social socioeconomic rights, there's always been two versions of them, right? There's the sort of idea of economic rights, meaning a right to participate in the economy, to buy and sell, to trade, to hire and fire. That is one type of socioeconomic right. It's sort of more of a libertarian socioeconomic right. And then there is the sort of left wing version of socioeconomic rights, which is the right to particular goods, and that goes back, you know, as as, as far back as civil and political rights. I mean, Tom Paine wrote about, in, in The Rights of Man, uh, wrote about, in part two of The Rights of Man, wrote, wrote about, you know, social welfare, uh, a social welfare state. So there is this long tension about rights to economic goods and rights to sort of participate in the economy as an as an independent economic actor. And that's something that we have not um, yet resolved. I guess I, I didn't react as, as strongly to the Canadian case. I guess because I'm familiar with the fact that in the UK there is no prohibition on having private insurance and 
you know, it's used by wealthy persons to sort of jump NHS queues. Um, heck, in class the other day, we did the Medicare Act and Section 1395B, right? Nothing contained in this title shall be construct, construed to preclude any state from providing uh, protection against the cost of any health service. We, we sort of build that in. So I so suppose at one point, uh, from one perspective, this could look like sort of, you know, school choice. Um, uh, if a public program excels, then it should crowd out the private. On the other hand, in healthcare, sort of the Iron Triangle tells us that it's extremely difficult, maybe impossible, for that pu public system to excel to that level. Um, I do think it's a fascinating uh, 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 perspective on the debate. Yes, it, it is. And I mean, the role of the private um, insurance, uh, allowing private insurance is an ongoing discussion in the U.S. Um, single payer community um, and existing sing single payer bills, including Sanders bill, does in fact exclude and outlaw um, um, duplicative private insurance plans. Um, so it's a it's, you know, I, I, a lot of, I, I do believe, um, you know, as you said, the U.K. has gotten by and allowed it. I, I do think that you risk fragmenting the public system by having competing private insurance plans. Uh, and um, maybe that hasn't happened in the UK, but I would be concerned in this country um, that uh, people would opt out, that, they, that, that the wealthy would uh, not participate in the public system, purchase private health insurance plans, and you could have sort of a, a, a two-tier system. Uh, but that's a larger discussion. And with that, I'd like to transition back to our U.S. discussion, sort of current events of the moment. And this has been a big month for single payer among Democratic senators. And I think the most pressing argument that I really love hearing more about is some people argue for single payer, and then you get resistance from people who say, well, why not just have a public option? And I'm wondering if you could describe, Adam, you, I read your piece on, you know, why not a public option? What are the main reasons why? Why we might be suspicious of that as the next incremental policy step toward universal coverage. I think we need to think about what our long-term goals are, right? So if your long-term goal is to shore up the insurance exchanges, um, the, mar the, the ACA marketplaces, then the public option may in fact achieve that uh, to some extent. But if your long-term goal is in fact um, universal health care, 100% uh, coverage um, without financial barriers to care, it just doesn't do that much, right? So, I mean, um, you know, public option, the way it's being spoken about now would be a plan on the ACA exchanges that would compete in some fashion with the uh, private plans. Some people have argued that this should um, only happen in places where there's not much competition. Um, Obama actually made that point in his um, article about the ACA in JAMA last year. Um, others see it as something that should be available nationwide. Um, but either way, you're really only dealing with a relatively small um, sort of part of the U.S. healthcare system, right? I mean, a small minority of people purchase plans through the exchanges, um, and of those, um, um, in, you know, some percentage would might buy the public plan. But how would the public plan, for instance, affect overall uninsurance rates? So the latest number is 28 million remaining uninsured now, right? Um, and it's not clear it would actually affect it at all. Uh, the Congressional Budget Office actually um, did an analysis analysis of a private option added to the ACA exchanges in 2013. And maybe things have changed somewhat since then. Um, but um, it found that it would not have a significant effect on the number of uninsured. It did find that if you paid physicians Medicare rates, that that would reduce spending and reduce the deficit. But it didn't find any change in the uninsured um, over, in terms of system-wide. Um, the other thing the public option wouldn't do is really help people who already are insured but don't have um, um, very good insurance. And this is something that, you know, I think is a misperception about single payer, which is that it's only about covering the uninsured. I mean, one of the, for me at least, one of the key parts of, of one of the things that animates me is, yes, I do want to cover everybody, but I think most people agree with that now. Uh, most people on the sort of liberal to left spectrum. Um, uh, but it also would in, improve health care for people with insurance. And so, you know, I, uh, Kaiser Family Foundation's latest employer um, survey found that over the last a decade um, deductibles have risen by three three hundred percent 
Um, this is something that I've seen sort of clinically as well, people with high copays for drugs, skipping dosages of medications, all that stuff. So for me, that's a really important part of healthcare reform. And so the public option, it's not clear it would do much to lower the number of uninsured. Maybe if it, we tweak it, a new, a new CBO estimate might found some benefit, but it's not going to have a huge effect on the 28 million uninsured, and it's going to have almost no effect on the underinsured. Um, so for me, it doesn't really, I, I'm always in favor of incremental steps. I'm certainly in favor of expanding Medicaid in all the 19 states that hasn't been expanded to. I would never withhold something that really helps people um, or not or, or, or not advocate for it just because it's not the, the whole package. But it's not clear to me that the public option would really um, have a major impact in ameliorating the uh, deficiencies of the healthcare system now. Yes. I mean, I really see those problems, Adam. And I wanted to add one other sort of political consideration that I think might distinguish our scenario from Canada's, which is, you know, I've been focusing over the past couple of years on the relationship between the federal direct provision of student loans, uh, as mandated, ironically enough, in the Affordable Care Act in 2010, and the interaction of that with the existing private student loan industry. And what I found is that, unfortunately, a lot of times the private student lenders lobby extremely aggressively to corrode the terms of the public program in order to create more business for themselves. And that hurts students. Uh, it hurts the sustainability of the public program. Um, and I just wonder, do you think that that's yet another worry with respect to a, a the potential peaceable coexistence of, say, a public option and private options? That to the extent that given you know, Citizens United and the way the American political landscape works, there will be such aggressive lobbying by private options to corrode the public option to enhance their relative attractiveness that, you know, after a few election cycles, it will not be a public option worth having anymore. Um, I think that's a, a definitely a possible, not only a possibility, a probability, um, if not a near certainty. Um, yes, the if you created a public option that was so amazing that no one would ever not buy it, um, for the insurance companies, they're going to view that as an as essential threat and fight it as hard as they would a, a single payer, right? So it is most likely that a public option that is passed as sort of a compromise is going to um, give a leg up in some way to the insurance industry. I mean, some of the things that people do talk about a lot are the fact that a public option could rapidly become a sort of high risk pool um, that um, through various ways uh, the insurers could cherry pick um, the lower risks. Um, they could find the patients who were less sick. And as the public option um, became higher risk and, has, and, and as more patients gravitated, gravitated towards it with higher health needs, you'd see premiums rising in that program or, you know, depending on how you financed it, um, it would be seen as, you know, this dysfunctional government program. Um, so that is a real risk. Um, and, you know, I think we've seen something like that play out with Medicare Advantage to some extent, right? I mean, the current iteration, but even previous versions of, of Medicare Advantage, the insurers have taken all sorts of tactics and they've changed as over time to to sort of game the system. I mean, there's a Justice Department suit against some of them right now, right, on the basis of upcoding, potentially upcoding illegally. So we have seen this play out with Medicare Advantage and we would see if something very similar play out if we had a public option. And so for that reason, it's not at all clear to me that a public option would be a road to something better. Like that's one of the arguments. Well, let's start with a public option and then and then see where that takes us. See if it's so great, then people will gravitate towards it. And then that will be sort of an argument for single payer. I don't see that happening. I could I could see it actually functioning in the opposite way. How do you feel about the the following analysis? We have today, courtesy of the Affordable Care Act, an attempt to patch together something close to universality. But we think that filling the last of the gaps is going to exacerbate our cost problem so dramatically that that healthcare becomes a m even more politically charged event as people look at the, sorry, Frank, the percentage of GDP and so on. <laughs> and that therefore, sort of before we complete our incrementalism of moving to method of moving to universal care, we are putting out these public option plans, these buy into Medicare plans, these buy into Medicaid plans as a sort of a, an attempt to seriously bend not the whole cost curve, but parts of the cost curve to make it economically possible 
to complete the incrementalism. Right. And I think that there are two ways of looking at that, right? So one, I, and if I understand you correctly, you know, you're, you're sort of saying, do we need to find out ways to fix costs before we proceed all the way to universalism, right? So we fix costs first, and then we, yep. and, and, yep. and then that will give us, um, that will make things affordable enough so that we can go all the way. Um, and that is one argument. The opposite argument is actually um, going to universal care through a single payer financing mechanism would in and of itself create the efficiencies that you're talking about or, or would bend the cost curve. So those are the two arguments that are out there, right? And we can talk about the sort of relative merits of each, but one of the primary reasons why people do advocate for single payer uh, is because they think that the, that, 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 that the second argument I said is the one that makes more sense in the US political context, that having the efficiencies that could be generated through a single payer financing mechanism would create the savings that you need to cover the uninsured. And it's going to cost money to cost uh, cover the uninsured, as you said. You know, I think there's a Kaiser Family Foundation study that found that the uninsured spend about half as much as the insured on health care. For the 28 million uninsured, whatever they're currently being spent on them and by them, um, we'd have to double that. that. That's a lot of money. And so the argument for single payer is we actually need a single financing mechanism to generate the savings to cover those costs. So time is pressing us, Adam, but can I finish with a question that asks you to to wear both your health wonk and your political wonk hats at the same time? I'm used to wearing multiple hats at the same time, so that's... <laughs> I'm more than happy. <laughs> While doing so. Um, so this this week in the Times, the ever-wonderful Marco Sanger Katz has a piece on single payer, and she says, quote, like repeal and replace, single payer is a broadly popular slogan that papers over intra-party disagreements and wrenching policy choices. Republicans fumbled multiple attempts to replace the Affordable Care Act this year. If the Democrats eventually wrested back power, they could find themselves similarly factionalized and stymied over the details, the details obviously of a single payer initiative. Well, I think there's many things that separate the Republican Obamacare repeal effort from single payer. I wouldn't put them in the same category at, at all. The reality is, is that the Republicans had no real vision of health care. Um, you know, in many ways, the, the Affordable Care Act borrowed a lot from Nixon's health care plan from the 1970s, and then affixed to it a Medicaid expansion and an individual mandate. The Republicans did not really have a health care vision. So they hobbled together something um, that really was sort of House Republicans, Paul Ryan's sort of brainchild, um, that essentially maintained the structure of the ACA um, in some respects, but degraded it, squeezed it of funding, slashed Medicaid. It was not a really distinct vision, and, it would, and, and because they, they didn't really have one. Um, now, single payer, in, is, in contrast, is something much different. This is an idea, it's essentially national health insurance. It's a concept that's been around, you know, for a very long time, um, modified to present-day circumstances in the United States, um, that people have been talking about, um, you know, at least since Truman. And so the current version has been worked on by a number of policy people um, for some time. Um, and so I just would not put them in the same category at all. Now, are there differences on specific policy questions that are going to be big fights? Absolutely. I mean, even um, if you look at the Bernie's bill and compare Bernie's bill to Conyers bill, there are some differences. Um, you know, and there are some problems actually in uh, the Sanders bill that, that actually I, I think are problems that, that I'd like to see remedied. So yes, there's going to be um, uh, a great deal of, um, uh, conflict is too strong of a word, but there's going to be a great deal of having to work through these policy differences. Um, um, having to make compromises, having to um, decide what this single payer system would look like. But this is an old idea. This is national health insurance. It bears no resemblance to the Obamacare repeal effort. And that was the week in health law. A big thank you to Dr. Gaffney for joining us. Uh, you can find him on Twitter at A-W-G-A-F-F-N-E-Y. And also let me recommend his blog, The Progressive Physician, which is theprogressivephysician.net. Adam, really many thanks for joining us. This was really wonderful. Thank you for having me. We post our show notes at twill.com. I am at Nicholas Terry on Twitter and Frank is at Frank Pasquale on Twitter. Thank you for joining us and have a legally interesting but healthy week and watch out for zombies.